Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, I've called this talk Spatial Computing for Humans, and I'd like to start by asking us to turn our attention to um, something that makes us inherently human, which is our senses. Uh, so the big five, we're probably all very familiar with vision, audition, olfaction, taste, and touch. Um, it's probably Aristotle that first denoted these about 2,000 years ago, so that's pretty out of date now. And we now understand that this is a far too simplistic way to think about our senses. If your senses are a dedicated set of receptors, um, that they're there for a particular physical phenomenon, then it makes sense to, rather than just taste, we talk about bitter, salty, sweet, sour, often a fifth one, umami. Um, and similarly for touch, you would de designate between perhaps pressure sensors, we have designated receptors for uh, thermoception, sensing heat and cold, um, and also for pain, which is what nociception is. And that's an interesting one because pain is actually very important for making us learn how to keep ourselves safe. Um, it's an interesting problem in robotics, how you do that negative enforcement, so a robot doesn't necessarily harm itself or, or its environment. We have a lot of other senses as well. There's chronoception, which is a sense of time, which is how I'm going to stick exactly to 15 minutes for this talk. Um, we have proprioception, which is how you know where your limbs are in space. Even if your eyes are closed, you know perhaps where your arm is. Or chemoreception, for example, which is a sensing of chemicals, of hormones and other transmitters within your blood and in your environment. For example, you're able to sense the uh, acidity, the pH level of the cerebrospinal fluid in your spine. So we have many senses all throughout our body, and these are constantly being integrated information for creating our perception and making up how we think. But what is it to think? So we'll start with the brain. Uh, this is a type of reconstructed image called a tractograft, which shows the neural connections within the brain. It's an incredible image. You can see the kind of outline of the side of the head there, and then going down into the neck of the spinal cord. Um, and this is just a very thin slice, showing a few of the neurons. But in your whole brain, you have an estimated 100 billion neurons. And uh, it's an electrochemical signal moving from neuron to neuron and kind of propagating through thousands of neurons like a wave that makes up a thought. But we don't have neurons only in our brain. Actually, when you're a fetus, you have a certain amount of neural matter called the neural crest. And as the fetus develops, this splits into two. Roughly half of it goes on to form your central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord, and the other half goes off to become the autonomic nervous system, which is this mass of neurons found throughout your body. So this is a tractograph of a slice of the colon, which is the large intestine in your gut. And it also contains neurons. In this image, you can see them colored red, embedded into the flesh around the outside. So in the human gut, there's an estimated 400 to 600 million neurons, which is a lot less than the brain, but that's still a lot of neurons. It's about as many as some small snakes or lizards have in their entire body. And the more we understand about the gut, the more we understand there's actually a certain amount of cognition going on in there, so much so that the gut is now kind of called the second brain. Um, it's something that we kind of probably understand implicitly already. If you look at language, you might talk about listening to your gut, and that would be insinuating that there's a kind of a seat of truth or intuition here. Exactly how we think and how we perceive is not fully understood. It's a field that requires inputs from neuroscience, but also from philosophy. But we do understand increasingly that we have cognition that takes place not just in our brains, but also in our bodies, and this is called embodied cognition. And embodied cognition is not just confined to the gut. Um, embodied practices, such as playing a musical instrument, such as this violin here, tend to involve much more than just kind of direct signals that come only from the brain. Again, it's something we can acknowledge in language when we talk about muscle memory. Um, and neurons are very fast, but they still have to travel over distance. And it takes about 0.3 of a second from your eye seeing something for the electrochemical signal to be sent to move your finger. Whereas if you look at expert violin players such as Charles Yang, his fingers are moving faster than the time it takes from a signal to go from finger to brain and back again. And so we're starting to understand that there are things going on within the body that are not always just coming directly from the brain. We're not just kind of like a single driver sitting in the head driving this meat bus. There's a lot more going on in our bodies. So if we accept that cognition can happen outside of the brain, why would you limit it to stopping only at the skin? 
Um, a spider's web is understood to be part of its cognition, what we call extended cognition. It's an object that the spider creates in the real world and then uses to glean information about its environment that its senses would otherwise maybe not bring it. It's also understood now that actually spiders don't just kind of sit there waiting for vibrations, but they're constantly tuning their web, tightening or loosening the different strings in the way that you might tune a violin, for example, and using this as a way of judging, kind of turning up or down the level of information that they receive through those vibrations from different areas of the web. And so the web in that is an, a tool of the spider's extended cognition. And it's also been argued that humans have extended cognition. Um, in 1998, two philosophers called Andy Clark and David Chalmers released a paper in which they argued for the extended mind theory. Um, and in it, they used an example of a person with Alzheimer's who uses a notebook to write down things that they might otherwise forget. And they refer regularly to that notebook as a person without Alzheimer's might refer to their casual short-term or long-term memories. And they argued that this notebook was a tool of the cognition in the same way that I might use my memory. Now, that was in 1998, it was before smartphones, but it actually takes no ontological changes to their theory to make it also relevant for smartphones and for computers. And you can say that these digital realities that we're creating, moving on to spatial computing now, uh, actually are tools of extended cognition, a kind of metaversal spider webs that we're kind of creating in the space. But this is what they look like, right? This is the form that the majority of our computing to date has taken. And I think the biggest problem that we have with digital computing, the form that we've made it, is that we've made it to basically predominantly communicate with our eyes and sometimes with our ears and on quite an understanding of the way that we function as a kind of a mind in a body rather than as an embodied creature. And the problem with this is that we're missing out on huge channels of communication that are very important for emotion, for memory, for learning, for value judgments. And so what I do with my studio, The Feelies, is that we try and create stories that actually speak to all of your senses and kind of you can inhabit as an embodied creature with an embodied cognition. Our work is mostly artistic, but it does also, we're realizing what a powerful tool this is, and I wanted to take you quickly through a few projects uh, to demonstrate some of the kind of different ways that, that that power can kind of be applied. I think VR too often gets lumped with having to kind of foster some kind of social use, but we did within this particular project, we um, collaborated with Greenpeace, with Alchemy VR, and uh, the Munduruku, who are an indigenous people in the Brazilian Amazon. And they're facing a lot of threats uh, in that they live in the forest, and the forest is under a lot of threats from mining, from incursions by roads, uh, industrialization, and so on. And of course, they have their indigenous lands rights to the place, and this is also of interest to the entire world to protect these ecosystems and mitigate climate change. So we needed to help them. Using this tool, we decided to try and see if we could foster interest and empathy within urban populations for what the indigenous populations were going through. And so the Munduruku invited us to stay with them in the forest for a couple of weeks and they kind of showed us the sensory surrounds of their lives there. And then we also did various data measurements as well and took a lot of multi-sensory data to create the kind of the fabric of a multi-sensory virtual reality experience that we would then make um, and first host in Sao Paulo and then other urban centers around the world. Uh, this is the experience we made. So it consists of a 360 video, um, an olfactory narrative of six bespoke perfumes, uh, heat, wind, humidity, uh, infrasonics, and, and a few other things as well. And um, what was interesting about it, and in fact all the projects we make, is we don't do visual content with other senses added on. We kind of create original content that's multi-sensory from first concept stages. So sometimes without vision as well, really thinking about uh, this embodied way of perceiving and thinking. And I mentioned we, we kind of shot the piece in a multi-sensory way in the forest, and we did indeed gather a lot of data and inspiration there, but it's not a literal kind of transposal of uh, stimuli into an experience. You kind of approach it as any storyteller might. So what we, we created this experience by designating the emotional arc that we wanted uh, audience members to go through and then placing the sensory stimuli together on that arc. And we're constantly being aware of any sensory stimuli that's on somebody's body at any one time so that you can choose to create a coherent experience or perhaps deliberately create a dissonant experience. Um, and this idea of understanding how the senses go together to make up a perception is an idea called cross-modality, which is a, a fascinating um, field really that I'll talk about more in a moment. 
there are challenges when you're trying to kind of work in a multi-sensory medium in that the, the kind of the tools and the frameworks for this don't really exist. So we've had to create a lot of them ourselves along the way. For this particular experience, it was a, a what's called a three degrees of freedom experience. That means that you're sitting, taking part in it and looking around you in 360 degrees. And so for this, in this gallery in Brazil where it first launched with a one-month show, we created our own kind of one-person sensory 360 theatres. Uh, this was the first kind of concept sketches and his model. And we also wanted it to travel, so we created kind of a 3D puzzle of wood, natural materials. We wanted to borrow that from the subject of the story. And it can kind of come apart, go in the back of the van, and drive on somewhere else. The most recent one was actually in Copenhagen, so not far from here, during the pandemic. And it got shut down after two days because somebody got COVID, which is the problem, obviously, with small confined spaces. Um, but... It's been a wonderful piece, and it's had and it's had excellent kind of response. It's won a lot of awards, and you really kind of start to understand the power of bringing in these different sensory signals onto people's bodies for fostering empathy and um, kind of interest and emotion. I mentioned cross modality briefly, and to talk a little bit more about that, um, your modalities are your senses, and cross modality is then how your senses come together to form your perception. Uh, I think we understand very well the way that perhaps visuals and audio signals go together. The soundtrack for Jaws, for example, makes the footage a lot more scary. If it was a different soundtrack, it wouldn't be so scary. Um, but this kind of uh, cross-modality exists across the other senses as well. So if you were to, for example, give somebody a lemon and you were asking them to experience the lemon and smell the lemon and look at it and feel it, and then ask them to place it on one of two shelves, a high and a low, depending on which one felt right, the majority of people will place that on the higher shelf because of the kind of the acidity of the lemon, its smell, the taste that you associate with that, the brightness of its color and so on. And they have associations of height. So this is a piece by called We Live in an Ocean of Air by a studio Marshmallow Laser Feast. And we collaborated with them to create the, um, the, the sensory track of the piece. Uh, we worked on a wind track and also an olfactory narrative. The piece is about the giant sequoias in California, and they created the visuals using a LIDAR, a kind of a laser scanning tool from architectural practice that takes in the form of the trees, and then they uh, take that out as a point cloud, many m billions of dots, and then put that into a digital model that you're actually able to, using virtual reality, go in and walk around and, and kind of interact with. Um, you're able to see the carbon dioxide and the oxygen exchanging between you and the tree and so on. It's wonderful. And the whole piece is based around a sense of height. So your journey is that you begin to explore the tree and slowly you rise up into the canopy and there's a kind of a feeling of... Uh, dissolution and, and ecstatic kind of utopia and arrival and so on. So I mentioned the visuals were shot with the LiDAR, so it's a kind of taking of data and then artistically manipulating it. Uh, similar techniques were done with the audio, which is actually taking the um, biophonics, it's, you can get music from plant signals and then turn that into an audio track. And so for the olfactory track, we wanted to mirror these kind of, these different uh, channels of basing it on science and then creating. So we were able to take an olfactory analysis, a chemical analysis of the air within a sequoia grove, extract the identity of the olfactive molecules within that, and then that creates mm, kind of an olfactory signature of the air in the sequoia grove. We then worked from that to break it up and kind of base four perfumes around it that followed this idea of the sense of height that you follow through in the experience. It can be a bit of a funny idea to talk about height when you come to scent. If I had sense to, to give you all now, I think we'd have no trouble understanding. But within kind of sound, scent and sound are actually very similar in terms of how you can tell stories with them and the emotionality and, and some of these other concepts such as height that they can be contained within. And so you have the deeper scent uh, which is kind of muddy and rainy and it has a lot of the hummus and the biological matter from the soil. Slowly rising up to the canopy, you end up with kind of notes of eucalyptus and things that encourage your body to kind of vasodilate, bringing in more oxygen and you're kind of encouraging that to flood to the brain. This is how this experience was housed. So this is six degrees of freedom. Uh, you'll wear a virtual reality headset and you have the computer in a backpack on your back and you can walk freely within this room, a three-dimensional space. Up to 12 people can be in there at once and they can each see each other in the virtual space and all, all are also experiencing this kind of wind and perfume journey as they go through the visual and the audio journey. Um, 
one of the last things I will probably sum up in the short time we have together is uh, the scent is an extremely powerful storytelling tool, and it's one that we tend to work with quite a lot. Um, you have olfactory receptors, obviously the majority of them are in the top of your nose. You also have them in your skin, in uh, your gut, in your heart, and in your liver, which is quite surprising. And you can actually see, and now we can measure, different physiological impacts of different scents on the body. Just before the pandemic, I was lucky enough to win an artist residency with Issei City in Japan. And this is the global home of Shinto, which is the kind of indigenous spiritual practice of Japan. And they have these um, shrine buildings. These are full building size. This is just an aerial photo. The design specifications for which were made over 2,000 years ago. And they very specific that they need to be constructed of a wood called hinoki, which is a Japanese type of cypress. And also very specific that it needs to be used in a way that is unvarnished, untreated, and it allows the bare wood to be exposed to the environment. And what that means is that hinoki is an unusually odorous wood and it has a very strong aroma. And so when you're visiting the shrine, it's subtle, but you take in the aroma of this wood. And if they, in fact, regularly rebuild the shrine, so you find this olfactory effect is as fresh every 20 years as it was 20 years before. And now, with the tools that we have, you can actually do an analysis of the Hinoki scent and find that it contains very high amounts of a molecule called alpha-pinene. If you give somebody alpha-pinene to breathe in when they're in an MRI, you can see actually it's reducing the amount of oxygen in the right prefrontal cortex of the brain. What that means is that it's actually activating their parasympathetic nervous system. It's lowering their blood pressure. It's lowering their heart rate. It's the, it's the rest and digest state. It's the opposite of fight or flight. And so you can, in visiting these spiritual places, through even just the sense of the materials that are chosen, you're starting to have a physiological response that is accompanying your journey to visit the divine, which you would encounter when you visit this shrine. And these parallel journeys are a path I find very interesting for ongoing research. We can use this kind of uh, wisdom that you see applied by humanity for thousands of years in more technological contexts, whereas I feel often it kind of gets left behind. So this was a Six Degrees of Freedom experience, um, an immersive theatre piece called Somni by Ellipsis in London. And in here we created a kind of room-sized sensory architecture that applied different sensory uh, surrounds in real time based on people's movements through different virtual realms in a single physical space. Um, it's heat, wind and, and scent. But the piece was about uh, lucid dreaming. It was a complex, wonderful story about an AI that encouraged people to kind of sleep and lucid dream. And so we were able to really explore that kind of chemically within the sense that we composed for the piece. Um, some of that was kind of scientifically found. So it's peer-reviewed science has found that if you breathe in the scent of rose as you're sleeping, it actually affects the emotional content of your dreams. You have more positive dreams. Sulfur is the opposite. If you hate anyone that you're sleeping with, you can let a smell of sulfur out in the room. Um, but Korea, for example, there's a tradition of having a bath with large amounts of mugwort armoires, which is a herb, to encourage kind of dreaming later at night. And herbalists and other kind of lucid dreaming um, enthusiasts will also mix in clary sage and clove. This phrase here, olfactory and neurogens, it means substances that when you breathe them in are more likely to encourage lucid dreaming when you sleep. And I love that way of being able to kind of reach out for traditional or folk knowledge and try and integrate it into these more technological contexts we are, because I feel there's, again, a lot of wisdom that is being lost. We have challenges along the way. As I mentioned, the kind of the infrastructure is not really there, so we have to make a lot of it ourselves. Uh, these are our scent devices that we've been developing now for about five years, um, and they enable us to have scent narratives. One of the problems of working with scent is that it lingers, so you can't really change it. If you can't change, you don't have a narrative. And these ones allow us to actually have scents kind of appear and disappear, which makes it a wonderful storytelling tool. Um, most of the projects I've shared with you today have been virtual reality, which has the advantage that people can't see what's going on in the room, so you can have all kinds of equipment. Um, but of course, we're moving more into futures of mixed reality and augmented reality. And so the invisibility of um, structures that would deliver physical sensory stimuli to you that are supposed to go with the virtual realm that you're inhabiting, it's more important that they become more invisible. We've been working with universities, experimenting with different frequencies to either contain or propel scent invisibly, and also with frequency, it is possible to generate a sensation of touch on the skin. So these are all ways that can kind of go in the future, but um, I just think it's so important that we acknowledge how we think, how we perceive, if these 
realms that we're creating, our metaverse, is going to be our extended cognition. We need to very deliberately create how we want to think, how we want to perceive, and what kind of intelligence we want to exist in as embodied creatures with an embodied cognition. Thank you very much. Thank you.